Thank you, Judge Forbes, so much for meeting with us today. If you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your background and what has led you to this Supreme Court race. Hi, uh, that'd be great. Thank you so much, um, Kayla, for having me. And, and thank you to the AAFP or OAFP, excuse me, um, for taking the time to uh, get to know a little bit more about the candidates for the important office of the Ohio Supreme Court. So I am uh, Lisa Forbes. I'm a judge on the 8th District Court of Appeals. And I, um, before I became a judge, I was for 27 years, I was a practicing attorney. I uh, was for 17 of those years, a partner in a national law firm where I practiced in the area of uh, complex litigation. So I, I handled complicated factual matters and complicated legal matters. Um, and now as a judge on the Court of Appeals, I review any kind of question that comes from any trial court anywhere in the state of Ohio. So as uh, Lisa Forbes, judge on the 8th District Court of Appeals, I am running for the Ohio Supreme Court because I want to do my part to make sure that the high court serves as a firewall that protects our democracy and the rule of law. I want to make sure that the high court um, has justices on it uh, and that the court is fair, balanced, and independent. Um, I will bring those traits to the court. So um, with my background, I bring expertise in the law to uh, to this position uh, now, and I would hope to take to the high court. But I don't think that having expertise in the law alone is sufficient to make a good jurist. To be a truly good jurist, you need also, I believe, to be um, to be more grounded in uh, in the community and in particular in the effects that the law has on people's lives. So I, uh, one of the ways that I accomplish that is my commitment to the community as a, um, as a, a volunteer board member, and this I appreciate, um, might overlap with some information that we address later, but I have served on the board at an organization, uh, a human services, social services agency here in Cuyahoga County that um, for about 15 years. Uh, it's called the Centers, used to be known as the Centers for Families and Children. Um, it is a conglomerate with Circle Health, which used to be known as the Free Clinic uh, here in Cleveland, and then another organization called uh, the Cleveland uh, Christian Home for Children. Uh, those organizations under the umbrella of the Centers, we provide high quality physical health care and mental health care job training services, Head Start services, and adolescent uh, residential ad services to adolescents who are caught in the foster care system and the county cannot find foster care for them. So um, I've been doing that, as I said, for about 15 years and just finished my stint as chair of the board there. That work helps me to be grounded in understanding uh, what the law means um, outside of the sphere of um, the little black characters on the white page that judges deal with. Um, and I uh, also uh, hope to take to the high court my work ethic. I am the granddaughter of immigrants, uh, and that is where I learned my work ethic from my grandparents. Uh, both my grandfathers were coal miners in Western Pennsylvania, and I am a first-generation college graduate. I only went to college thanks to work-study, student loans and waiting on a lot of tables. Uh, and I, I tell you that because I appreciate that as a candidate for the Supreme Court, I am really the embodiment of the opportunity my grandparents came to America for. And I wanna make sure it's available for generations to come. So that's why I'm running for the Ohio Supreme Court. Um, a little bit about what I hope to bring to the court. And I look very, very much forward to the rest of our conversation, Kayla. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, what would you say is your judicial philosophy? I believe that it, it, it is imperative that every case um, be approached uh, as without any expectation for outcome, right? I start with the briefs that come to me. I am a court of appeals judge, so I am reviewing a record that's already been made at a trial court. I review the briefs, I read the law, I review the record. Um, I uh, look at the evidence, if evidence was presented below. I, um, I, and I 
do my own independent research as well into the case law to try to understand um, how the law and the facts come together in any individual case. I am not and never do engage in result-oriented decision-making. That means that I don't decide how the outcome of the case uh, should be and then backfill with reasons. I uh, think that it is imperative that judges apply the law when it is clear and only interpret the law when it is ambiguous using the plain language of this whatever statute or constitutional provision is at issue. Thank you. With the country experiencing polarizing political factions and an increase in partisanship, how can the court system be a model to provoke civil discourse? I think that's a very interesting um, question. I think there's a couple of different, um, there are a couple of different ideas that come to mind. Um, one is that I agree with you about the increasing polarization um, in our court. And I think that one thing that's really, un or in our country, one thing I think is really unfortunate is the increasing politicization of the judiciary. That is deeply concerning to me. One way that that is manifested is that we have party affiliation on the ballots for Supreme Court candidates and Court of Appeals judges here in Ohio. This will be the second election in the history of the state of Ohio that the Supreme Court and Courts of Appeals judges will have party affiliation on the ballot. Trial court judges will not have party affiliation on the ballot. That is common police court judges, municipal court judges, when the legislature changed the law in 2022, uh, starting in 2022, they thought it was only important to identify party for Supreme Court candidates and Court of Appeals candidates. Against, they did that against the recommendations and the strong protestations of the Ohio State Bar Association that speaks on behalf of all lawyers. The OSBA said, do not do that. We do not support that. The Ohio Judicial Conference similarly suggested that there was no place in our um, in our electoral system for there to be party affiliation on the ballot for judicial candidates. And yet here we are. Um, we have, um, and I think that we should get rid of it. <laughs> I think that it gives a very bad, um, a very bad impression that somehow the outcome of any case is determined by the party of the judge. Uh, any individual appearing before a court should have confidence that that court is going to dispassionately apply the law to the facts of the case to arrive at an outcome that has nothing to do with party. Um, so I think that is one thing that we could do to try to um, get the uh, the uh, you know the polarization um, out. We need to enhance people's respect for and confidence in the courts. Um, another way that courts can lead the way um, is, you know, just trying to be models of civility within the courtroom, um, and that uh, hopefully will be uh, respected. And again, increase respect of parties and lawyers for the entire judicial system. I'm not overstating when I say that I find it so concerning, this politicization of the courts, um, that I, I'm worried that it, the breakdown in confidence in our judicial system can really have uh, grave negative consequences for our, in, our entire democratic system. You need an orderly system for resolution of disputes, um, and that is our judicial system. So I am committed to always... Um, trying always behaving in a way that is beyond uh, no appearance of impropriety, much less actual <laughs> impropriety um, to increase respect for the court. Thank you. What would you say has been your most difficult case and how did you handle that? So most difficult is, um, is hard really to slot into a single case because some cases are really difficult emotionally because of the very um, distressing and disturbing fact patterns. And I would say as a category, the most difficult cases emotionally that I deal with are cases involving either 
um, abuse, parental abuse, um, the severing of parental rights are, those are terrible, difficult, emotionally cases, um, cases involving uh, child abuse through, um, through inappropriate sexual conduct, um, really top that list. Uh, it's very, very distressing. Um, and then there are also cases that are just legally um, and or intellectually very difficult to just uh, maybe the the question is so close to the line as to what the what the proper application of the law is, um, or some are are just uh, difficult because they're novel. Um, and I'll just end with one example of a novel or difficult case um, that I dealt with had to do with the constitutionality of a sentencing statute. Um, and after a lot of research and a lot of careful consideration, I concluded that um, because there were no due process protections included in the statute, um, that the statute was unconstitutional, um, that there was a liberty interest that was implicated by the statute and that um, and that liberty interest needed to be protected with due process. Unfortunately, my opinion did not carry the day, and we had what's known as an en banc proceeding here in um, in my court. And uh, my fellow judges, although my it, my panel opinion did conclude that the statute was unconstitutional, after the en banc proceedings, um, it was uh, and uh, it was concluded that for other reasons. Um, that I don't need to go into procedurally here, um, that at the end of the day, the eventually the Ohio Supreme Court concluded that the statute was constitutional. And I'm gonna bring that case up because I really spent a lot of time analyzing and understanding the due process uh, protections and rights afforded to incarcerated individuals, which not surprisingly is a, at a different level than for you and me. Um, once you've been incarcerated, you've lost some of your rights. but um, nonetheless, uh, after I issued my opinion, it changed the discussion of uh, opinions that were being issued throughout the state. And in fact, once uh, when the Supreme Court ultimately did rule, finding the statute constitutional, it did recognize that the prisoners do have due process rights that must be protected. And if they are not protected, um, that a violation would occur. So um, I'm proud of the work there. And uh, I think that's an example of sort of how complex intellectually um, a case can be. Thank you. Can you describe one instance where you faced an ethical dilemma and how you resolved it? Um, I think I would go back to, um, as a younger attorney, I was also a notary public attorneys by virtue of having a license to practice law can also be notaries public. Um, and I was, and I provided that service to clients when they needed it or fellow uh, attorneys, colleagues. And at one point when I was much younger in my career, a lawyer asked me to assist by notarizing a document, which I said, sure, no problem. Um, and then he handed me the document and it had already been signed. Uh, what a notary is doing, um, depending, there are different functions, but in this circumstance, the document required me to say that I had sworn the, the signer, that the information included in the document was true, and that I had witnessed the signature, neither of which were true. The person who asked me to do that was senior to me, and um, it was uh, very awkward, um, nonetheless, I refused to provide the notarial services that he requested of me. Thank you for sharing. Lastly, what are your beliefs on volunteering and community service being a necessary commitment for persons holding office? And can you share some of the types of volunteering and community service that you have been involved in? I can, and I do. I do. As I mentioned earlier, I think it's imperative that to be a good judge, you do need to have a clear um, intellectual understanding of the law, as well as an ab ability to communicate that. But um, I think to really be a, a good judge, you also have to have uh, have ties to the broader community, not just other judges or other lawyers. 
And uh, one of the ways that I accomplish that is through my service at the centers. As I said, um, I just finished my term as chair of the board there. I've been involved with that organization for about 15 years, and I still am involved. And um, I'm very proud that during my service as chair of the board, we expanded the services that the centers provides to include those um, residential services, residential and wraparound services to the adolescents um, whose parental rights had been severed. And um, so they didn't have anybody, any adult to care for them. They were the county's responsibility and the county could not find foster care. These kids were sleeping in an office building and um, the centers, uh, we expanded our service line, we um, secured a facility and we started providing housing for these kids. And now we're, we're growing that programming because um, kids who are caught in this uh, web of the foster care crisis, really, that there aren't enough foster, um, enough foster families um, can have a, uh, a good, wholesome, comfortable place to sleep, regular meals, a regular routine, um, and, uh, and the services and care that they need. So I'm very proud of the work of the centers, and I'm honored to have been their board chair. Um, and uh, that is one example. I am uh, also active in the Bar Association. I help to do character and fitness reviews for uh, people who would like to take the Ohio Bar. Uh, I serve as a teacher in the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, where I teach a class called Rights, Responsibilities, and Realities, talking about um, helping kids understand information they need about civics, um, really constitution-based. And um, another example is, um, a current example is I'm involved with my, my church, um, so... Uh, those are current examples, but my um, engagement and service go back literally decades. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Judge Forbes, for joining us at the OFP and giving us the opportunity to share with our members a little bit about you and what has brought you to the Supreme Court race. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Hawkins, for joining us today. Um, everybody here at the OAFP is really grateful to have an insight into our Supreme Court candidates. So if you wouldn't mind starting off just introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about how you got into the Supreme Court race. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks for having me. My name is Dan Hawkins. I'm a, a husband, a father, a, a former prosecutor, and I'm a current judge on the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas General Division. I've uh, been a judge for 11 years now, and I was a prosecutor for 13 before that in Franklin County as uh, head of the Special Victims Unit uh, in Franklin County Prosecutor's Office, specializing in crimes of violence against women and children. And I'm running for the House Supreme Court because we really is a generational election this year with the Ohio Supreme Court. And I want to be part of a court uh, moving forward that can provide some stability in our legal environment and protect uh, our freedoms and the rule of law. Would you mind sharing about your judicial philosophy? Sure. So uh, my philosophy has always been as a judge and as I'll be on the Ohio Supreme Court. It's about keeping politics out of the courtroom. I think a judge uh, should be that neutral arbiter of, of a case um, to call balls and strikes. I don't believe in judges uh, putting their own policy preferences in their decisions. I think you should um, look at the statute, the uh, contract, the amendment, whatever the law is, and uh, not to substitute your own personal preferences for that law, and not to um, not to be an advocate from the bench, but to be that your referee, call balls and strikes and base your decisions on the law as it's written, as opposed to, uh, so to speak, legislating from the bench, so to speak. Thank you. With the country experiencing polarizing political factions and an increase in partisanship, how can the court system be a model to, pro pro to promote civil discourse? I think it's very important for our courts, uh, for our judges. Um, and part of that comes in from our own legal decisions. Um, to keep politics out of those decisions, um, whether it's a Supreme Court justice, a, um, a, a trial court judge, or an appellate judge. I think basing, showing the public, showing the lawyers, the litigants, 
that you're basing your decisions on the law and specifically pointing to the law uh, or the precedent you're basing that on and not any sort of outside uh, political pressure, outside uh, uh, political influence is very important. I've always done that in my decisions. I keep politics out of my decisions and out of my court courtroom, and that's my intention on the Supreme Court. Thank you for sharing. Um, what would you say has been your most difficult case and how did you handle it? So um, I, I could think of uh, a couple of my time as a prosecutor and a couple of the time um, as a judge. Um, I point out the prosecutor experience because it, it was a big part of my life as director of the Special Victims Unit. You know, I handled a lot of serious cases involving human trafficking, child sexual abuse, um, homicide cases. And I remember early on in my career dealing with very serious cases involving child homicides that were very difficult from a personal standpoint, you know, have, having a three children of my own. Um, but uh, my faith got me through that and my family got me through that. And the fact that, you know, I'm delivering justice for those families was at the end of the day um, helpful to me to get through that. Um, but on the court side, you know, I've been in a position as a judge where I've had to make decisions that I don't necessarily like to make, but the law um, requires me to make them. Um, I, I've had individuals who very sympathetic um, parties on a case where the law wasn't on their side and I had to rule against them because the law was very clear. Um, the contract said what it said and I had to uphold that. Um, judges sometimes have to make decisions that they don't like, uh, but, but the law says what it says and you have to follow the law. Thank you. Can you describe one instance where you faced an ethical dilemma and how you resolved it? Sure. I remember when I uh, first took the bench, um, I was a, a young judge, a newer judge, and I had a case where a, a, a local attorney, I think it was some sort of drunk driving case. It wasn't some big case, like a, an OVI case. And I remember a defense attorney wanting something done on the case. And I, I told him no, because, you know, quite frankly, it wasn't a Appropriate. I, didn't, I took public safety into account and I didn't want his uh, his client to get his driver's license just back. And um, he was very upset with me um, because he, you know, judges have to raise money for political campaigns. And and he was at one of my political fundraisers a week or so before. And um, I could tell he was really upset with that. Um, but there, there's, there are those situations where maybe somebody expects a certain thing because they, you know, provided campaign help to you. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to base your decision on what, what the law is, what's best. And then that you, um, I decided public safety was more important than whatever political help this guy gave me or thought he gave me. And um, I'm proud I did that. Thank you. And our last question, what are your beliefs on volunteering in the community service being a necessary commitment for persons holding public office and are there any types of volunteering and community service that you have been involved in to this point? Yeah, I think it's critical. I mean, we're public servants, but you know, the the, the job of a public servant should be much more than just nine to five, Monday through Friday. Um, I've always done that through my career, whether as, as a prosecutor, volunteering uh, my time, um, educating uh, doctors, nurses on our court system, uh, volunteering at Nationwide Children's Hospital or other area hospitals um, on training their um doctors and nurses how to be better witnesses in court. To my time as a judge, um, frequently going out and attending um, you know, block watch groups, uh, those community organizations that want to hear more and learn more about our court system. And then the last couple of summers, um, myself and my colleague, Judge Jaisa Page, have, have run a Justice for All Youth Summer Camp uh, for area middle school and high school students, a uh, one-week camp where we uh, introduce them to other judges and lawyers and the legal system. Um, we partnered with Ohio State Moritz College of Law these past two years where they will actually sit in the law school for a week and we, we end the week with a, a mock trial. Um, the, the kids love it. We, we, it's a great way to teach the youth about our system, more about our system, get them involved. Always love talking to, to kids and our youth, the next generation. Uh, so that's something we're really proud of. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for our questions. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and um, give our members the opportunity to get to know you and kind of the things that are important to you. So thank you so much, Judge Hawkins. And have a thank good you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us.